Hello, I'm Leonard Skov from Slovenia. I was asked by George to, to contribute to this uh, event. I'm really happy to be here. I have had a lecture at Maxwell Institute just two hours ago on, on more philosophical and uh, theological aspects of Mormonism, which I find really fascinating uh, as a scholar. And then tomorrow I have another lecture uh, for students on, on my uh, my view on environmental humanities. Now, I was not specifically asked to prepare something uh, for this uh, for this occasion, so I'll be a bit more fragmentary. Uh, but I will still try to, in a couple of minutes, pre present you with a couple of ideas from my work. Now, I'm uh, originally from Slovenia, where I'm head of the Institute of Philosophical and Religious Studies in a beautiful coastal town of Koper. Uh, near Trieste, but in, on the on Slovenian side, of course. Uh, I was trained as a philosopher, uh, religious studies scholar and theologian. I also studied Indology, so I was very much interested in, in Indian, Vedic, Upanishadic and Buddhist uh, tradition. Uh, and uh, yeah, in recent years, I've been quite interested in Mormonism, so I'm studying it quite a lot, and I found it as a genuine and most important post-Christian tradition, if I may say so, because I'm from the kind of Christian Catholic tradition. Uh, and, uh, but I cannot elaborate on this as I did at my lecture, but uh, maybe uh, towards the end of my intervention. Now, Slovenia is a relatively small country, of course. We have uh, some 20,000 square kilometers and 2 million people. It's an expensive country because you need to have uh, Parliament, government, ministries, uh, you need to build roads, you need to have universities, schools, everything. So it's a privilege to have a country. Uh, we got it in 1991 after the wars that, that were uh, in, in Yugoslavia. We were lucky, we had just had a 10 year, 10, 10 day war, and then uh, the Serbian army just uh, moved from Slovenia. And uh, we are now, yeah, also facing climate crisis, of course, just maybe one, one example, really a very simple one. I have two, two children, two kids, they're 9, 15, 18 years old, two sons. It was quite normal even eight, nine years ago to buy winter clothes and winter shoes for, for a season, but now not anymore. So uh, it's, we, we can see that in the last 10 years things got worse. Uh, now, I would maybe present three, three points. First one, uh, I would refer to dust storms uh, that uh, the first uh, speaker mentioned uh, uh, regarding to this lake, yes? So dust storms are appearing uh, here, yeah? So I will be talking about dust storms tomorrow, but you must know, of course, that, that dust storms in the 30s, not far away from here, were uh, the first actually man-made uh, ecological disaster in American history. And I may uh, just read an excerpt from one of the books on, on dust storms, um, and I will tell you why. Let me quote from, from Timothy Egan, The Worst Hard Time. In parts of Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado, New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas, it seems on many days as if a curtain were being drawn across a vast stage of at world's end. Cattle went blind and suffocated. When farmers cut them open, they found stomachs stuffed with fine sand. Children coughed and gagged, dying of something the doctors called dust pneumonia. In desperation, some families gave away their children. The instinctive act of hugging a loved one or shaking someone's hand could knock two people down, for the static electricity from the dusters was so strong. As the black wall approached, car radios clicked off, overheld by the static. Nothing compares to the black dusters of the 1930s, he says, a time when the simplest thing in life, taking a breath, was a threat. So obviously this uh, scene, uh, you can find this scene in Christopher Nolan, Interstellar, uh, a possible apocalyptic uh, move film. Now why I'm mentioning this? Because I was asked by, by George to, to address the problem of spirituality and environmental crisis. For me, spirituality, and I will talk about this tomorrow, uh, if you're interested at in this lecture. Spirituality is always related to, to its etymological meaning of the word spiritus. 
The word spiritus etymologically comes from the Indo-European root space, which means to blow, to breathe, to like you know, to have something be done with breath. So I'm a respiratory philosopher, I'm a philosopher of breath, and everything that I do is related to breath. Maybe because I used to be a professional musician, I played clarinet and then I did to stop for some reason, which I did not like, of course. But my life for a couple of years was defined by breathing through, through my body and playing an instrument which is the most, among the most bodily instruments you could imagine because it's really a physical effort and you literally breathe through the instrument. Now, first point is that spirituality always, for me, must be uh, understood as uh, something that is related to air, breath, to, to, to the spirit which is in all countries of the world, in its, you know, its most important uh, in traditions of the world or indigenous traditions, you can always find words for breath, like ruach in, in Judaism, then pneuma in Christianity, air in Greece, in uh, Anaximenes, prana in India, then in China and Japan, you have obviously ki or chi, then mana or enda in Melanesia, ik in, in uh, Mesoamerica, uh, then sila among the, the, the Eskimos, uh, then uh, I could just go and go in, uh, and find that in all, all uh, ancient, not only indigenous, but also major religions, there is bread that was later somehow uh, forgotten. And uh, we instead start talking about spirituality, which was then somehow connected to a, a wise uh, old man who is a priest and is a spiritual person, but he was, in, at least in the Catholic Church, he was never married, he was never close to, 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 to breathing life, to feeling something, you know, of a family life, of a, of a joy of a children and so on. So it was quite a reverse that, that should be. This is my first, uh, I just need some water, excuse me. This is my first, uh, I would say, intervention. The second one relates to, to this new fine book that I just got from uh, the author of this book is Michael Marder. Uh, it's titled Green Mass. So it is a book on Hildegard of Bingen. Uh, Hildegard, as you probably know, is, uh, was the Benedictine abbess. Uh, abbess who lived in medieval Germany between the years uh, 1098 and 1179, so 12th century. She was the first and foremost woman uh, mystic, philosopher, uh, and all other things, uh, composer uh, as well. And why I'm mentioning this? Because Michael Marder is my good friend and colleague. And Green Mass has a double meaning. You were mentioning cities. So cities are usually full of concrete and, and now plastic, so we live in the Plastitocene uh, era. And uh, if you look at how this mass of the plants is kind of falling down and the mass of concrete and plastics and all other like uh, materials which we built our, our cities is growing, it's really uh, it's sad to, to see that. And green mass means that this is a mass in a musical sense because this is a sound book, so you read the book and then you, you listen to the compositions of Hildegard and others. And of course, Green Mass also relates to the plants because Michael Marder is a plant philosopher. He invented plant philosophy 10 years ago. And this is a fine book. But why Hildegard? Obviously, because she's a woman. This is my second intervention. Uh, why, why we are in t where we are in, in the Tropocene? Uh, obviously, because firstly, we have forgotten to breathe, to, to feel the air, to, to be, you know, to share the air with others. And secondly, we have, I must say that, eradicated the feminine, the matrix, as I call it, from the history of Western theology, philosophy, and so forth. You can, I can ask you, name one philosopher until uh, Simone de Beauvoir, Lucie de Garay, or uh, Julia Kristeva, or Hannah Arendt, and you will have, uh, have huge problems except for Hildegard to Bingen. I can ask you name in one theologian before 20th century, and you will again be, have problems, and you will say maybe Hildegard of Bingen. Now, uh, why so? And I, I uh, admire Mormonism and uh, the mother in heaven, you know, for this reason. 
I admire Indian religions because they were able to preserve this uh, sexual difference in gods. Uh, Yahweh used to have a, a spouse, uh, Asherah, we think, I think, uh, 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 some researchers think. But if you go to, to, to the starting point of this, you know, matrice, it, it is uh, the occasion when God Zeus, you know, uh, actually swallowed and killed the, the goddess Metis. You again mentioned the waters of Salt Lake City, probably, or, or, or some other lake, I did not know. But anyway, uh, all over the world we see that waters are endangered as air in, and suffocation is, is endangered, uh, endangering us. So Metis, Metis was a pre, of course, a prehistoric uh, uh, goddess. Uh, there were many, many feminine goddesses in ancient Greek, as you know. There were Aphrodite, uh, there were like uh, Erinias, which were goddesses of blood, because they were, uh, if somebody would hurt the little children, they would revenge, of course, because they were protecting children, they were protecting mothers, they were protecting a birth, and, and they were protecting uh, uh, plants like Demeter. And when Kore was abducted and, and, and uh, raped by, by the, the god of the underground, Demeter, Demeter stopped giving, uh, giving, um, um, uh, you know, uh, seasons, uh, seasons when 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 things grow, you know, and you you harvest. Okay, I'm a bit tired tired today already. So and then Zeus, with with the start of the Olympic Gox, Zeus said to Metis, "If you are so powerful, come come to me and pretend to be a drop." And she of course did it, and he swallowed her. And what he did is that he gave birth to Athena himself. So the beginning of the European history, of European philosophy actually, because Olympic gods then prevailed and Olympic philosophy prevailed with, with sports and with, with athletics instead of like prana in India, uh, which is an internal uh, cultivation of energy. You don't need to run around you know, the stadium to, to prove something because you, you have your strength inside uh, as a bread you know, in India. So they're rather developing their own uh, internal spirituality uh, rather than doing all these sports that we are seeing in America today and all over the world. Now, for, for Zeus, he gave birth to Athena and Athena, Athena became a warrior goddess. So he gave, as a man, he gave birth to a woman, which is weird, of course. And even we can, we can uh, uh, read in one of the, one of the tragedies of, of uh, Euripides. I will just quote by by like uh, by, by uh, my uh, which what I remember, like this he says, mother is not decisive for the word. Mother would just take care of the growth of the baby, but the man, the father, would really give birth to a child. So strange, but this is how a Greek culture could produce such a sentence. So this is a second, I would say, uh, say scene that somehow. Uh, inaugurated the, 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 the development towards the Anthropocene. Uh, and for that reason, I think that we need a kind of a new covenant today. Uh, a new covenant somehow as a promise, if I quote from my own paper uh, recently published called An Animal Pneuma, you can find it on, on, on uh, Open Access. I said that we need a promise of a future biocentric and breathful environment new respiratory alliance with the world of, you know, not only other human beings, but with other species, with, with animals, with plants, as Michael Marder would argue. And I can quote from his book because he has a beautiful uh, uh, passage from Hildegard of Bingen. This is her creation story. In the beginning, all creation was verdant. In the middle, flowers blossomed. So there were flowers. And not like God uh, creating out of nothing or ex nihilo. Later, viriditas came down, like freshness is viriditas is, uh, is uh, uh, translated as freshness. This narrative div diverges somehow, this is murder now, from the biblical story according to which the newly created earth was barren, devoid of life. Hildegard indicates that all creation, including the terrestrial fold prior to the emergence of plants, is a site of the greening green. 
So the beautiful kind of sentence, the green in green. Uh, to conclude now, uh, and to, to, to return to my uh, topic of breath, for example, uh, in respiratory environmental humanities, I will lecture about them tomorrow, we have a couple of, you know, uh, ish, uh, topics that we are dealing with. One of them is, for example, bad air. Now, which are the, the, the most important uh, phenomena that we are studying? I will just go to this, uh, uh, my, so that I not forget something. They are wildfires, which were, of course, in Australia a couple of years, and also in the US every year. Dust storms, smog, um, environmental suffocation, other forms of unequal exposure to air pollution and bad air, climate change, and other forms of atmopolitics. Then we have medical humanities with COVID, with panic attacks, which are of course, all, all over the, the world uh, with nervousness about this. Then we have social political topics like police chokeholding. George Floyd was, was mentioned, no? I can't breathe. Eric Garner, police guessing. LGBTQ and intersectional context when people cannot breathe and so forth. And we may imagine because may, we might not be vulnerable here because this beautiful day in Utah and I see that, that the, you know, the Utah is not overpopulated. I see somehow it's, uh, there are no dust storms here. But still, uh, there's, it's in some places of the world, people really cannot breathe, literally or metaphorically. And for example, miners breathe uh, polluted air for us every day. So this is very difficult thought. If you are a religious person, you cannot sleep easily thinking of a miner tens of thousands of miners going into the mines right now just in order to substitute their health for our um, coal and so on. So they're substituting their health, their clean lungs, because they were born as, you know, my child, he was born with clean lungs and they were all born with clean lungs, but they, they, they were, of course, if they were born in, in parts of the world when it was their own possibility to go to the mine, they, they know how, how this uh, would end up. And not to say about, of course, all the polluted city of in, cities of India, uh, even Belgrade in Serbia is among the most polluted cities, close, close to Slovenia, for example, and so on and so on. So uh, these were just some couple of ideas of what, what I'm doing. Uh, spirituality then must be uh, somehow related to bread, to, to, to um, the etymological sense, we need a new alliance, somehow a new covenant, which would be, if we speak with Mormonism, uh, based on the elements, on something that is really, you know, that God is co-evolving with us, that God is close to us, that is everywhere actually, that intelligence will find ways, intelligence, we humans of course, that will find ways to fight uh, this devastating climate change. Thank you.